Good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. And that version of our opening theme by the talented Jacob Stark. Howdy there, folks. It's me, Vacation Derek. Except I'm not really on vacation. We're still hard at work upgrading equipment, setting up promo materials, and brainstorming. And just overall preparing for the upcoming 17th season. But as I mentioned last week, I won't leave you in the dark during our little hiatus. Of course, I have a handful of spooky stories to keep you company. Now, real quick before we get started, keep those calls coming. That phone number is 888-608-NIGHT and the email is monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com And don't forget about our merch shop, monstersamonguspodcast.com and click the shop tab. And be sure to check out that brand new Mirrored Men poster by friend of the show and talented artist, Caitlin Grabenstein. And finally, Shadows in the Desert, High Strangeness in the Brego Triangle is now available in the United States and in Canada. Visit borregotriangle.com to learn more. And if you find yourself overseas and not able to view the film, I'm working on it. I promise. Oh, and if you backed us on Kickstarter and you haven't yet received your rewards, please shoot us an email. We likely need to verify your address since it's been so long. A lot of folks move around. Now for the rest of you, check your mailboxes. Those rewards should be there soon. Now, tonight's program originally aired on two separate episodes. Season 16, episode 13, and season 16, episode 14. Exclusively on Patreon, of course. But tonight I've combined them, and I present them as tonight's offering. Don't forget to hear more like tonight's programming. Just visit monstersamonguspodcast.com and click the Patreon tab. $5 a month will land you a load of bonus content. Content like the Beyond portion of Season 16, Episode 13, which we join already in progress. After this message from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. I'm certainly guilty of feeling like there's never enough time in the day. But the thing is, what do we really need extra time for? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? Therapy can help you figure out what really matters to you, so that you can make it a priority and do more of it. Therapy has given me a chance to slow down and check in with myself, something we don't always take time for, the chaos of our hectic schedules, but it helps keep me grounded. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, which makes it convenient, flexible, and affordable. Just fill out a quick questionnaire to be matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Monsters Among Us today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash Monsters Among Us. Now, as always, supporting our sponsor supports the show. So thank you for listening. Now back to that beady-eyed beast you found under your house. And you can join us by visiting Patreon and searching for our name in the search box. Go Beyond, where we share stories like Julia's from Japan. Hi there. My name is Julia. I currently live in Chicago, Illinois. I've been listening to the podcast a little bit and... I've never, ever heard a story like my own, not even on your podcast. This happened in November of 2009. 
I had just moved to Japan and I lived in a small rural village and there was a autumn ceremony, a big festival going on a few towns over on Kompira-san. It's a mountain at the top of which lies a temple to the goddess of the sea. And on this particular night in November, there's a huge procession of priests and priestesses all taking her treasures down from the temple to a bridge where she will reside for one day and then be taken back up again. She has a golden palanquin attendance and she comes down like 800 stone steps. It's really, really an amazing sight. So me being new to the country, some local friends said, hey, let's go to this festival. So they took us to as high up the steps as we were allowed to go. So maybe about 600 or 700 steps up the mountain. And we watched the procession go by with drummers and flautists and torch bearers. It was just amazing. And the last thing that comes down is the goddess of the sea on her palanquin. And so after that had passed, we just started following the procession down and everybody else was too. And it was pretty chaotic. And this mountain town in Japan is crowded with houses and stone steps and alleyways. So about halfway down, we decided it was just too many people. So we snuck down a side alleyway away from the bustle and started walking down a, a really normal street, even normal by American standards. And on this street is uh, one of Japan's foremost kabuki theaters. So a friend of mine, also from America, was interested in kabuki and started talking to our local friends about it and went over to check out the kabuki house. But I wasn't interested, so I walked away. I didn't mention this before, but the whole festival takes place at night under the full moon. It's really beautiful. So they're over there looking at the kabuki theater, and I'm just kind of putzing around, walking away, looking at the forest and stuff and the bamboo grove that line the trees when I hear something in the bushes to the side. Now, my friends are like a good 50 yards behind me now, but still within sight. And I hear this rustling in the, the grasses up ahead of me. And maybe 15 yards ahead, uh, an animal jumps out onto the road. And I can't tell what it is. At first, I think it's a dog, a, maybe a smaller dog, maybe a foot and a half high, two feet high. And it's all white with black eyes and it has this weird shaggy tail kind of clumpy and the animal stops and it looks at me and if you've ever been looked at by a wild animal before it's a really interesting experience that just looks intelligent not scared not feral this dog looked at me as if it knew exactly who I was, what I was doing, and that it had no business with me. So it walked down the street and then kind of went off the path again, sort of back in the same direction it had come. And I kept walking, and it turned out there was a little stairway down to another alley right where it had gone down. And not five seconds after it went down, a gentleman came up walking his little poodle dog. And it struck me as so weird that that dog hadn't barked because a dog should bark at a wild animal. And it was right there. So I thought that that was really bizarre. So a couple of months later, I was at a work training in the city with a bunch of other Americans and Canadians and Australians. And one of the senior members of our group like took us a little tour around the city and we were all walking around, and the buildings are all really crowded together. It's very Japanese, but modern Japan. And snooped in between two buildings, there was a little shrine. And she stopped at the shrine, our, our tour guide, and was like, oh, you'll find a lot of shrines and a lot of little mini temples all throughout Japan. Their culture is Shinto Buddhist. It's super neat. You should look into it. 
And I was looking at this shrine, and I noticed that flanking both sides of the entrance were statues of little white dogs. And I said, oh, man, I've seen these dogs before. I saw one at the festival at Computer Sun just a little while ago. And this senior member of our group looked at me like I was stupid. And she said, those are dogs. Those are foxes. They're sacred to this god, Inari, the god of the rice harvest. And I said, well, do we have white foxes? I mean, because I totally saw this. And she goes, no, they're not even real. And if there are foxes in Japan, they don't live around here. They don't live on our island. So did I see a messenger of the god Inari that night when I was at the festival of the sea goddess? Was he sending her a message? I don't know. It's really fun to think about, but 100%, I saw that dog or fox, and it was just a really interesting experience. I lived in Japan for seven years in total after that, and I never had another experience like that again. But I did think it was really special and might be worth a unique mention on your show. So this is me signing off. Have a great night and keep it spooky. Thank you, Julia. You just gotta love that blind validation. You see, she didn't know the foxes were sacred or that they were associated with the festival she just attended. But when she saw another one, she knew she'd seen it before. That's classic validation. And I don't know a lot about the paranormal legends of Japan. But based on this story, perhaps I should start looking into them. Because I'm always a sucker for a canine ghost story. This one was pretty good. So thank you again, Julie, for sharing the entry. Welcome back to the after show, folks. It's great to have you here with us this evening. Things are settling down on our side. The holidays are over and the dog days of winter, I suppose, are fast upon us. But I've been pretty busy here in the studio. You see, I've been fighting the gremlins for weeks. The main desktop that I record and edit the show on did some sort of update a month or so back. And whatever it updated to rendered it basically useless. So I broke down and bought an expensive replacement, only for it to die on me two days into transferring files. So to produce this episode, I had to put the old tower back together. And now I'm negotiating with the company to get the replacement replaced. In short, it's a whole thing. You see, electronics just don't like me. Not to sound like a slider or anything, but if you give me your phone, nine times out of ten, it'll then do something weird. It's equal parts frustrating and strange. But enough about my struggles here in the studio. It's time for us to get back to the calls. After all, that is why you're here. And let me tell you, this next one comes to us out of Missouri. And it's quite the collection of spooky happenings. Johanna, the mic is yours. Hey Derek and Monster Among Us crew. My name is Johanna and I'm calling from Missouri. I have two stories for you about my witnessing of shadow men. Both of them actually take place in Southern California. That's where I'm from. Um, the first story takes place back in, it must have been 2006. I was about 16 years old and it was in Redlands, California that this happened summertime. And my mom had just moved us to this old house. It's in like the downtown part of Redlands near State Street, like in walking distance to the Kikorian movie theater. So anyways, uh, from the moment I stepped foot in that house, I was terrified. It was just all bad vibes. For some reason, like in the very back part of the house, I never wanted to be back there. I would get this like super strong feeling of just fear. Anyways... One summer night, I was asleep in my room, and the way my room was set up, 
the door to the room, you could see the front door of the house. And I had a rounded window, and you could see the front yard from my window. So anyways, uh, one night, uh, my mom's boyfriend and his son were spending the night, and my boyfriend was spending the night. And they're all kind of like camping out in that living room area. And my mom, who is like a chain smoker, stepped out to smoke a cigarette, and I went to sleep. Like, I was just asleep in my bed by myself. And I hear this, like, tapping on the door, like this urgent tapping, and it was my mom. And I hear her go, Joey, Joey, open up the door. I locked myself out. Apparently, she locked herself out while she's smoking. So I sit up, and when I sit up, my door was open, and I could see the front door. I see this figure go towards the door like it was going to open it. So in my head, I'm thinking, oh, my mom's boyfriend got it. And I just laid back down. And then shortly after, I hear the tapping again. Joey, Joey, open the door. And so I was like confused. And I got up and I opened the door and I look around and everyone was still asleep and the house was dark. And so I just told my mom, I'm sorry. I could have sworn I saw, you know, your boyfriend come to the door and open up the door. And I didn't really think much of it, and I just kind of, like, went back to bed. But waking up the next day, apparently his son thought he heard someone walking around in the night, in the middle of the night, and so did my boyfriend. And it was just really, really creepy. And at that time, I didn't really know what a shadow man was, so I just was like, did I see a ghost or something? I don't know. It just, like, really tripped me out. So... That was the first experience. The second experience happened also in Southern California, and it was quite a while like later. Um, I was 24 with the second experience, and it happened in Montana, California. I was living at this time in my mother-in-law's house, um, renting a room, and I was pregnant with my first daughter at this time, and I was like eight months pregnant. I was asleep in my bedroom, and I usually never sleep with my back towards the door for some reason. But, you know, when you're, well, you probably don't know, but when you're pregnant, you just sleep however you're comfortable. So I was asleep, completely asleep. And I like to sleep in the dark, too. And so my room is pitch black dark. And I'm sleeping by myself, and I feel a push on my back, like, you know, someone's nudging me awake. So I turn around and I see the figure of a man and in my head, I'm just thinking, I mean, again, the room's really dark, so I can't, I just see like a silhouette. I assumed it was my boyfriend and I sat up and I was like, what do you want? And as I was saying that, it started backing up and I was like, Daniel, Daniel, what do you want? And eventually as It got closer to the corner of the room. It just kind of, like, disappeared. And so I was confused. So I got up, and I turned on the light in my room, and I'm like, what the heck? There was nothing in there. And I opened up the door, and my boyfriend was awake, but he was in the bathroom. The bathroom door was, like, right in front of our bedroom door, and the light was on. And I went, Daniel? And I hear him go, uh, yeah, what? And I was just like, ah. and so I closed the door and I went back to bed. And after that experience, and even kind of before, like that house and that room always seemed a little bit creepy. Um, but after that experience, um, after our daughter was born, her toys would kind of like randomly go off in the middle of the night. Not all the time, though, just like random. And it was awful. And I really did not like that. And then Also, I was rocking her one evening, and again, in the dark, in the room, and I was trying to put her to bed, and I was rocking her, and I just hear this loud, like, crash on the floor, like something was thrown, and I was like, what the heck, and I turned on the light real quick, and I had this baby wipey warmer, and it was on the dresser, and it wasn't close to the edge or anything, it was like on the middle of the dresser, And it was now, like, on the other side of the room. So it was, like, thrown across the room. And I was like, what the heck? And I just tried to ignore it and continue putting her to sleep. And I've also woken up in that room to see, like, a mist, a shadowy mist, like, out above me in the dark. You could tell it's, like, there. And it's just, like, hovering over me as I'm looking up at the ceiling. 
you know, waking up in the middle of the night to that and like staring at it. And I'm trying to determine if I'm just seeing things. I'm like rubbing my eyes. Um, and it was just really weird. And my boyfriend claims he also saw that at a separate time too, that he saw and he woke up to like a shadowy, darker than dark mist that he said he was staring at it and he was like struck with fear and he saw it like go out the window and almost kind of like heard a laughing inside his head as it went out the window and he used to always get paralysis real bad at that house like reoccurringly get it and since we've moved and we've like been on our own like I always sage and cleanse the house like first thing before any furniture goes in there and I did kind of wonder um, because before the shadow man incident happened at that particular house we had bought a or not bought we got for free at an estate sale an organ from a man who died and his family was just trying to get rid of his things and I kind of wonder like if that thing was attached to that but I'm not sure but anyways um, love your show love the podcast I'm like 100% addicted and I have plenty more paranormal stories and I'm Hope to call in again soon. All right, take care. Thank you, Joanna. You know, Redlands, California is literally just down the hill from here. Like 10 miles away as the crow flies. It's a really nice area. It used to be a massive citrus grove. I imagine there's probably all sorts of history that flows through that area. Thanks again, Joanna. Okay, squad, I have one more story to share with you here tonight. And like Johanna's, this one too covers several different experiences. And this one is also from the state of Missouri. Please welcome another anonymous caller to the program. Hi, I live in Kansas City, Missouri, and I have about three kind of ghostly experiences. Well, not kind of, they definitely are that I've had over the years. So I grew up in St. Joseph, Missouri, and this was about 10 years ago, actually maybe 12 years ago, I was in middle school, and my mom would drop me off in the morning at my dad's house so I could catch the bus stop from his house. And I would hang out, my stepmom and sister would leave to go to school and work, and I would go downstairs in my room and just lay in bed until it was time to go to the bus stop. And the basement was laid out, you went down the stairs, and there was kind of a family room area as soon as you walked down, and the laundry room was to your right, and then my room was all the way at the end of the basement and it kind of went the width of the house at the very end of the basement. It was all carpeted. There was a desk and a computer, uh, like a desktop computer set up in the family room area. So I experienced this quite often. And um, I would be laying in bed and all of a sudden I would hear tapping sounds kind of, and this is the best way I could describe it and what I think you know, the sound was, but it sounded like someone was sitting at the desk and tapping pencils against the edge of the desk. And mind you, I said no one was home. My sister and stepmom had already left. My dad was long gone. He worked very, very early, so there was no one in the house. With this tapping sound, I also heard heavy footsteps walking, like pacing back and forth on on the carpeted area and shoes weren't allowed in the house whatsoever no one ever wore their shoes in the house so even if someone was home they wouldn't be wearing shoes and it sounded like very heavy footsteps like wearing steel to work boots and we had cats but like I said they wouldn't make this heavy footed sound so I don't know I heard that very very often at least twice a week for probably a year. So I don't know if anyone, you know, passed away in the house or whatever. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on that. So then I'll go to my second experience. I was driving to work and it was about 6.30 in the morning. And on my road to work, it was a long stretch of 
road that was surrounded. There was school on one side, there were soccer fields, and a bunch of farmland. So crops, soybeans, corn, whichever season it was, I can't really remember. But it was still dark out, and I was driving. It was probably, I was on this road for about three miles. And I'm at the halfway mark before I take my turn, and I see a lantern. It looked like someone was holding a lantern above their head walking down the right-hand side of the road, on my side of the road. And I slow down, and as I slow down, this lantern starts coming towards me, and I see that there's a man and coveralls and a like flannel shirt and hat looked like a farmer just straight up you know cliche farmer get up and he starts walking towards me when I am driving by him and I slowed down to probably about 20 miles and kind of swerved there was no one else on the road kind of swerved over into the other lane and get back over and I look back and there's no one there absolutely no one there was no one else driving. There was no parked cars. Like if someone was to play a prank on someone, the school was closed. It was a weekend. There, the soccer fields weren't open. I don't know. It looked so real. And when I turned around, there was no one there. So I'm not really sure what that was about. I worked at this job and drove this road for probably about three years. And that took place probably about two years ago. So... Yeah, I don't really know. I've never seen anything like that before. I can't explain that. But my last experience happened probably about six months ago, six to nine months ago. I now work at a prison and I work at, well, I'm not going to specifically say it, but if you want to do some research, you can. The oldest federal prison. It used to be a penitentiary and, you know, a very, very dangerous place. Lots of people have died. So, I mean it's a hotbed for experiences so a lot of people have had experiences such as like jiggling keys in the middle of the night while they're making their rounds like someone's walking behind them just seeing people inmates or staff there were a few staff members that were killed at the prison so just seeing people that aren't there and when they turn around there there's no one there but my experience took place in our largest unit, and it's three floors. Basically, all the cells are in the middle of the unit, and the outside is completely open. So there are stairs and kind of like um, a catwalk surrounding the cells in the middle. So you can, you know, walk and go down the stairs, walk around the, the cells. There's cells on both sides, and it's really big. So I was on the top floor, and at the time, it was a quarantine unit due to COVID. So I was sitting up there, you know, letting a couple guys out to shower and make their phone calls and stuff like that. And so I only had about 15 inmates up there that I needed to let out to shower and stuff like that. And it would go in rounds of two. So I was sitting at a chair at the end of the range of cells reading a book and the cell in particular that I'm going to talk about was probably about 30 yards away from me and I had just let the guys out to shower and I'm sitting at this chair eating and about 10 minutes go by they get about 15 to shower so I'm sitting there about 10 minutes go by so they should be coming out of the shower any minute and like I wear glasses so it's out of the top of my glasses I it looks like someone walks into this open cell and so I give him a minute I'm you know let him get situated and see if he needs to you know get water or ice or whatever it may be so I sit there for a second and then I get up and I start walking towards the cell that I watched this person go into no other inmates were allowed on this top floor because it was quarantine. And if they did go up there when they're not supposed to, they would go to special housing. So they absolutely were not allowed whatsoever. 
and I never had I worked this spot for about a month and I never had an incident where someone tried to go up the stairs when they weren't supposed to or be on that particular floor when they were supposed to so I don't think that another inmate would come up and go into the cell because they knew the repercussions and it was a very serious matter of being in the quarantine so I start going down to this cell walking down the range and all of a sudden I see the inmate that's assigned to this cell come walking from the shower that's assigned to the cell and I look at him funny and he's like what's going on and I was like I could have sworn I just saw you walk into your cell and he kind of cocked his head and he was like huh because all the inmates know the history and stuff like that they know you know people have died and stuff so and that's kind of a touchy subject with anyone especially someone that is already in a vulnerable state you know such as being in prison or whatever and being in such an old building you know they are kind of wary of that so he kind of looks at me and he was like are you sure and I was like yeah I was like, someone definitely walked in there, and that's why I was walking down here to come and see if you were ready to walk down. And he, like, starts getting all nervous and stuff like that, but so I'm not really sure. I mean, like I said, a lot of people had died. I know that there's that history and that possibility that, you know, there's a haunting and stuff, and that unit in particular, I have heard stories specifically that people have died and one particular story I heard was that an inmate jumped from that top floor so I mean maybe that's just a story and maybe that's not true but I could see it happening Um, an inmate gets high or something on some illegal substance and wigs out and jumps I could see it's a pretty far drop so I love the show. My friend told me about it, and I have been binge listening to it for about two or three weeks. I'm on season five now, so I love the show. I'll continue listening, and if anything else weird happens, I'll call back. Thank you. Thanks, caller. Yet another entry full of experiences. And the prison ghost. That sounded awfully familiar. I swear I heard a story just like it when I toured the Mansfield Penitentiary in Ohio last fall. There's just something about jails and prisons. Something that makes them magnets for activity. Just like as our caller described. Disappearing inmates and all that. Well again, we thank you caller for sharing that entry. As if you needed a reason not to go to prison. And we thank you, Monster Squad member. We really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us here in the beyond. And we especially thank you for the support that got us both here. Now for Season 16, Episode 14's Beyond. Beginning with Jack from parts unknown. Hey Derek, this is Jack. Long time listener, love the show. Keep up the good work. The reason I'm calling in is I've been binge listening to your episode, currently sitting in season seven. But every time I hear something relating to the triangle-shaped UFOs, it jolts a memory. This isn't a first-hand account, but I grew up in Southern Illinois, right next to the town of the infamous black triangle-shaped UFO that's now famous of Southern Illinois. My buddy's dad was actually a first responder in the Fairview Heights Police Department when it happened. He arrived after it was already gone, but soon after he arrived, the military police actually showed up from the nearby Air Force Base. You know, less than 10, 15 minutes down the highway where the sighting occurred is Scott Air Force Base. Very busy very large, I believe one of the largest Air Force bases in the country. A lot of, obviously, air traffic due to its central location. But, you know, that being said, grew up, saw a lot of, you know, maybe unexplained, I don't want to 
go and call them UFOs, like yourself, I'm a bit of skeptic and like to think of the realistic reasoning first. But a lot of, lot of lights at night, a lot of slow moving objects, always just assume they're part of the base. And honestly, when this first happened, Triangle Shaped UFO, it wasn't huge news in the area. Everyone just assumed it was part of, you know, the ongoing Air Force Base operation. It wasn't until it started leaking out to uh, national websites and newsreels that became a big deal. That being said, it makes me think, I know Belgium's a big one as well. Belgium's right across the English Channel from the UK. Plenty of Air Force bases there, especially with the RAF, the Royal Air Force. The two thinking points are, one, these are experimental aircraft, whether they're some form of the B-bomber, etc. You know, arrowhead shape is a very long thought of aerodynamic craft shape. So they're either experimental, claims the Air Force, yeah, the military police want to keep it hush-hush, or it's folks from, you know, another planet scoping out our military capabilities. You know, I know there's been a lot of sightings of UFOs around nuclear power plants, you know, missile bases, etc. So, you know, not exactly a sighting, but it's, I'm always itching to call in, at least give my feedback, you know, my opinions and kind of, you know, what I heard by growing up in the area about this actual craft. Keep up the good work. Looking forward to more shows. Thanks. And thank you, Jack. If for a while, the black triangle seemed to be the go-to shape and color that most people reported with their UFO sighting. But lately, it seems that there is more of a flavor of the week. As we just discussed, the jellyfish UFO is now all the rage. But mark my words, the next craze will certainly be the jetpack. I've already seen a handful of videos come out this week. But regardless of your favorite UFO shape, we thank you, Jack, for taking the time to call in. Well, welcome back, Monster Squad. So nice to have you here with us tonight. Now, come clean. I had a big plan for this evening, and last minute, it all sort of fell through. So we're going to push that a couple weeks and call an audible. So as you might have guessed, tonight's episode will be a grab bag. Had Delaney added down a couple of calls. So tonight, I'll be hearing these calls for the first time, right along with you. And to keep us going this evening, we begin in my state of California, where Jay is waiting with an entry. Hi, Derek and Monsters Among Us listeners. This is Jay from California. Wanted to share a little bit about some, I guess, possible ghosts that my daughter has seen. And yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit about that. So my daughter, when she was nine months or so, this was in like 2018. We used to live in this little apartment in Oxford, California. So she and I would be often home alone because my partner worked overnight and still does sometimes. So anyways, on one occasion, I remember where I was feeding her. This was like sometime in the evening. I don't remember like what month it was or anything, but I, I remember that she and I were home alone and I was giving her dinner. We were in my kitchen really small kitchen, small dining room area. And I was facing her, you know, usually when you feed your kid, you're kind of sitting in front of them sometimes. And so I was sitting in front of her and she was facing our living room area. So I was feeding her kind of like, oh yeah, like try this. And like, you know, kind of doing the the mouthing of the food and stuff. But anyways, I see that she's a little distracted and like I could see her look past me and didn't think anything of it. But then what struck me as kind of odd was that she then began to, like, I knew she was seeing something behind me and she was following something with her eyes back and forth across the room. We didn't have any pets or anything else in the home. There was nothing at the time that would be, like, distracting her. It was a pretty, like, quiet night. So anyways, her attention is on something moving across the room, kind of back and forth. And then what really creeped me out was that she did that for maybe, like, a few seconds. And then whatever she was looking at must have come really close to her because then all of a sudden her attention went towards the center. Like whatever she was looking at back and forth, she like went to the center and then she moved her head back 
and her eyes kind of like not crossed but like they kind of came to a, a point that something was clearly in front of her so she kind of moved back and i mean she was less than a year but you know she didn't have any issues with her eyes or anything so i had asked her mama like you know what is it she couldn't talk but she clearly had seen something and that kind of took me a little bit so i like looked behind me there was nothing there you know i also thought like maybe a bug or something nothing of that sort was there so that was kind of odd and my partner and i noticed on occasions whenever we would change her diaper or like just kind of around the home that we would see her entertaining something like towards the ceiling she'd be looking at something and on a few occasions she would wave and so that was a little odd we weren't really sure what she was looking at but she could clearly see something that was really odd you know that happened while we were at that apartment also another note is that the apartment we lived at people would say they were haunted i don't know if that's true or not it was really close to a cemetery and so people would say that those apartments were haunted anyways we moved to a new place about gosh i guess it's coming up to two years actually but anyways we moved into this home i think it built in the 1950s kind of older home and things have been fine but on, on one particular occasion my daughter and i were home alone again my partner was working and i put her down to bed and we usually have this thing where like i stay with her so she's four now so I stay with her in her room while she like goes to bed or goes to sleep and I'm usually like on my phone I usually have my earphones on that's to not to like distract or anything I'm usually listening to your podcast or like doing some online shopping or other things but on this particular occasion which I feel like has happened a lot more this last year I kind of leave her on her own I feel like you know she's gonna be five soon and I have stuff to do anyways put her to bed and she had asked if I was going to stay with her and I'm like no I have to finish up our laundry so this must have been like I don't know maybe like 9 30 or something this must have been in the summer sometime this year so anyways I left her in her room I let her know I'd be doing laundry in the next room over in my bedroom and I turned off her lights left her little night light on and left her door open our hallway light was on Anyways, I was in the next room and I was listening to your podcast and I had my earphones on and so I was folding laundry and then I think I must have finished an episode and I started to like listen to YouTube and stuff. Again, on that theme of like paranormal and like ghosts and then somehow got to like mediums. So I was doing the laundry for a while. It must have been like an hour in. At this point, I was listening to the Long Island Medium where they do the readings for like a group of people and this was on YouTube. And so Teresa, the medium, was doing this reading for this guy who was talking about someone who passed away by a car accident. And so the way that she was talking about this person who passed away from this car accident and the way that this person had died where they sustained injuries was really similar to how one of my cousins passed away when I was like a teenager. So it was interesting because I had me thinking of him and she mentioned this part about like, when you think of them, know that they are with you. It felt good to hear that, to think that when I think of him, he's around. And so I decided to stop listening because I just wanted to leave on that note. And so I turned off YouTube and I took off my headphones and I went to her room to put away her laundry. So I walk in there very gently, quietly, and she's up. And she's like playing, which she doesn't do that. She's never really done that before. So she was playing on her bed with like two plushies. And she's like, mom, why didn't you stay with me? And I'm like, first of all, I was like freaked out. I was like, why are you awake? And she's like, oh, mom, like I'm playing. And I'm like, why are you playing? She's like, well, you didn't stay with me. And the ghost stayed with me. And I was like, wait, what? Which I thought was really weird because ghost isn't part of her regular vocabulary we don't really play ghost games or anything related to that i do listen to a lot of like your podcasts and other things but i have my headphones on for that i feel like it's my self-care so i kind of don't out when i'm doing that anyways i thought it was weird she said that and she's like yeah he stayed with me because i was alone and i just thought it was really weird i'm like oh i'm like okay a ghost and she's like yeah and i'm like 
oh, okay. So I just kind of asked like very like general questions, not trying to like lead her or anything. And I'd ask, oh, so like, is he small, big or medium? She's like, oh, he's big. He's big. And she's like, but he's gone. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I thought that was, again, really weird that she mentioned that. Again, that term isn't really in her vocabulary that she uses. You know, maybe we'll talk about ghosts like during Halloween time when we're watching movies or something, but not really during the day-to-day kind of a thing. So I just thought it was really weird, and I wondered if it was maybe my cousin who was just kind of checking in or kind of keeping my kid some company. Anyways, I just wanted to share that. Sorry for it being so long. I just wanted to make sure I have all the details. Thank you so much for what you guys do, and keep it up. Bye. Thank you, Jay. Well, you know what they say. That animals and pets have a unique ability to sense or even see the other side. Wherever that is. And I'd recently heard somebody mention this, and I couldn't tell you where. But they posited that perhaps babies and animals can see a spectrum of light that we simply cannot. And in that spectrum of light lies these spirits, these ghosts. Well, not being a scientist myself, that sounds good to me. But I would love to hear from maybe a pediatric optometrist or something like that. Is there any truth to the rumor? Well, if the events surrounding Jay's daughter were any indication, that answer is yes. Thank you again, Jay, for taking the time to call in. Now, folks, don't forget, if you're listening to this episode, that means you get access to the VIP shop. Just visit MonstersAmongUsPodcast.com and click on the VIP shop tab. When prompted, enter the password. And you get instant access to a secret line of clothing. In addition, if you would like to purchase from the main shop, as a Patreon member, you get a discount. Just use coupon code for 10% off. Now then, I have one more call I would like to share with you this evening. And this one comes to us from Oberon. That's State Up North. Hi, my name's Oberon, and this story takes place in Plymouth, Michigan. It is my childhood home, in fact. So where we begin is Plymouth, Michigan, for a hot second, was just farmland. The community started to grow. I'm not entirely sure when, but my dad remembers when it was still a dirt road community. So my parents moved into that house uh, around the time I was two years old, right before my brother was born. And that house always had its own personality. There were a couple of weird things, but I'm going to focus on one spirit in particular. And the first story starts when I was four years old. So just to give you a quick layout of this house, we were in a tri-level. So my parents' bedroom was straight up a flight of stairs. And directly down from that was a closet with just a little hallway that divided the kitchen, which is on the right-hand side, looking down from the steps and the living room, which was on the left-hand side. When I was little, I would have a hard time sleeping through the night. So my parents had a little sleeping bag just on the floor because I was too big and I would steal all the covers. And so they would post me up on the floor. And that little sliver was right in front of the door, which was obviously looking down the flight of stairs. And this experience I wrote off for a while because I didn't feel it was legitimate based off of what I'm about to describe to you. So I was about four, laying on the floor, having a hard time going to sleep. And I decided it was a good idea to play this game called, let's see if someone appears at the bottom of the stairs. So I would lay down, keep my head down and raise it up really quick and look at like that little landing near the closet and there'd be no one there. I would kind of repeat the same process. And then there was one point I waited a really long time and I shoot up and I'm staring at the closet waiting. 
And I get what I asked for. Coming from the kitchen is this six foot tall shadow figure. And he limbers in one step, two step, very slow. He stops dead in front of the closet. And I'm kind of getting chills actually telling you this story, but he stops right in front of the closet. He's still, and he's head's kind of down, and it's a profile shot. And he's still facing the living room from the kitchen in which he just walked out of. And slow, slow, he turns his head up and looks at me directly for about five seconds. And I'm quiet as he looks at me. And he slowly turns his head back, faces forward towards where he was, takes two big, slow lumbering steps into the living room. And I slam my head down. I go to sleep for the rest of the night. And I wrote it off because of the circumstances surrounding it. But then I turned to legitimizing it with my next experience. I did want to include some further details of really the events. So I was young when these things happened, but this was like under 2010, early 2000s is kind of when this was happening. That kind of brings us to our next story. So I told you that I completely wrote off the first one because I felt like I was a dumb child playing a dumb game. And that leads me to this encounter, which I was not a dumb child playing a dumb game. In fact, I was about 10 years old and I remember I was having a dream and People were in my house for some sort of gathering, but I had something like the next morning and I had to go to sleep early. And in my dream, I very much remember there was this moment where it was me sleeping in. I had a loft bed at the time and there was a cutout on both sides where you could place the ladder accordingly. And in my dream, I'm sleeping and it's like a corner shot of my room and it's empty aside from me sleeping and it's pitch black. And in my dream, my dad starts waking me up and he's, I can see him, he's shaking me and he's saying my name and he's trying to get me up. And then it's black, pitch black. And I still hear my dad calling my name and I open my eyes and I see my father and he is staring at me through the cutout of where that ladder isn't on the one side, but um, right near my face. And he's staring at me and he startled me, but he's like looking at me with this fire and this intensity and he's not blinking and he's not moving. And the only way I can describe it is like, if you pause the TV screen, that same sort of like static, still unnatural movement or lack thereof. And I am startled, but I'm like, what the, like, you know, like what, what's going on here? And I sit up in my bed, I sit up physically and I remember kind of like grabbing my arm a little bit and I'm, I'm realizing I am awake and I'm like, okay, no, like maybe you're not awake. Maybe this is still a dream. Like he'll be gone when you look back. So I turn my head over my shoulder and he is still there. And he is static. He has not moved from the position he was staring at me at. He has not moved his eyes off of me. He's just staring straight at where I was. And so I turn my head back and I'm like, okay, that's, that's weird. Well, what's he doing then? Like, I'm trying to make sure that this is like actually happening. I'm like, okay, give it another second. I turn my head back. He is still there. And I look forward again and I'm like, this is like, okay, this is weird. And I audibly, audibly say, dad, because I'm confused about why he's doing this and why he woke me up like this. And I'm waiting for him to move or say anything. And he just won't. And I'm looking over my shoulder at him again for this final time. And I kind of see him like, It was like a piece of his shoulder kind of like flicked out like a pixel dying on a TV, like that kind of just nothingness. And his form started to kind of do that completely. And he turns basically into this black mass and he creeps 
across my room and into my vanity that I had with my big mirror. And I remember sitting there and just being so awestruck because I'm like, there is no way this happened. I was waiting to wake up again, to be completely honest. I was waiting to wake up again from this dream, and I don't. And I stared at that mirror for five minutes, waiting for something to either come back out of it or like something to change or just any sort of response. And as soon as I realized, oh, that just happened and I am freaking out, I jump off of my bed, like down from the ladder. I was in gymnastics. I was in really good shape at the time. So that was no problem of a jump for me. But I jumped straight down four feet from my bed, take no eyes off of that mirror as I run around the corner from my room into my parents' room. And this was the first time I've been on the floor of my parents' room in forever because I'm 10 years old and I had very well grown out of that by that point. I run into my parents' room and I throw my pillow down and lay my blanket down and my dad sits up and kind of looks at me sideways. And he was obviously asleep in his bed the entire time that occurrence happened. That story freaks me out still to this day. I've had quite a few ghostly encounters, but like nothing has ever happened with that figure since we've moved out of that house. But his presence was very oppressive the entire time I lived there. I never felt like I was alone and not in the comforting way. I just always felt like I was being watched. So I think that that guy would still be tied to the property. But I just wanted to share that with you. I had a friend turn me onto your podcast and encouraged me to share this story with you. I hope that you can make some good use of it or it helps explain some things for other people. Keep on doing what you're doing and thank you for giving me a place to share. Bye. I don't know, Oberon. I'm not sure that's going to explain anything for anyone. That story was incredible. And it leaves me with a handful of questions. First of all, why the father? It seems so strange that it was him, of all people, drifting through the room. Was this somehow related to that shadow person in the first call? Or are these two completely separate events? Is this somehow associated with alien abduction? And I say that because of the mere aspect. I've heard several alien abduction claims that suggest that these beings, wherever they come from and whatever they are, pass through mirrors as they would a portal or a doorway. And my final question would be, does the father have any recollection of any of this taking place? If I were you, Oberon, and you still can, I would ask that question. And if you do, please let us know what you find out. And thank you again for sharing the call. Well, that's going to do it, folks. Thank you so much for joining us on this bonus episode. I'll catch you back here next week with something else special. And don't forget there will be no Beyond portion tonight, but check back in a week or so. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Delaney Bowers. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And tonight's score was provided by Armchair Ambiance, Co.AG Music, and Carl Casey, and White Bat Audio. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'll catch you next week. Keep it spooky, and have yourself a good night.